Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman. Uh, I believe we have a mic that's not on. Test. We just weren't going to make you wait another two minutes. You've been waiting long enough. Yeah. Testing. There we, there we go. There we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I think I just reflected poorly on your belief in my filling time skills. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We just know that it's warm outside, and these guys have been waiting, and I thought, we're not going to make them wait any longer. Well, the... Uh, we're <laughs> The way we're going to do this is we're going to do a little bit of a chat with Adam and Jamie, and then uh, about halfway through, we're going to open it up to your questions. So when I uh, mention that uh, we're going to start questions shortly, you'll start lining up behind. Can I have a wave from the staff member who's going to be taking the questions? Hey, back there, we're going to start lining up. And then we will take your questions for Adam and Jamie. So also, uh, when you guys have the video ready, go ahead and give us the high sign. Oh, it is ready. Okay, this is... Oh, okay. You will. <laughs> All right. Uh, and this is just, it's some fun teaser footage from Mythbusters, and uh, we thought you guys would like to see it, but shall we start? Well, I think uh, first thing I have to ask is, when did you two first meet each other? <laughs> we, now, first, yeah, we first met when I asked Adam to come over to uh, interview for a job at M5 at my shop. Um, I had some other employees, and we were busy. It was in... Uh, what is it, like 20 years ago now? It's now 20 years. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, I had, you know, we did commercials and movies and stuff and, and uh, always relying on freelance talent in the Bay Area and San Francisco. And, um, and, you know, you don't know what somebody can do until you actually get them in there. And so it, it, it's a little, and, and we do, the, by definition, the work we do in special effects is problematic. That's, that's what we enjoy, and it's, it's stuff that nobody else can do. So whether somebody can actually do that or not, we don't find out until we've had them in for a while. I was in the habit of relying on recommendations from other people quite a bit. Uh, so that it would save me time and, and uh, you know, you, you don't like to get people in and then fire them. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, some people like that. But. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, one of Adam's friends was an employee that was there and he kept telling me that I needed to meet this guy named Adam Savage, that uh, we would be of like mind. And so eventually I, I brought him in to, to check him out. Yeah, and this is uh, one of the most unexpectedly perfect job interviews ever in which uh, instead of bringing a portfolio, I had interviewed in special effects a couple of times before and had always shown pictures and had gotten a kind of bad response. So this time I showed up with a suitcase full of things that I'd built and we talked about them here and there. And then I had recently seen, or not recently, but a few years before, um, Chris Wayless, who owned a special effects shop in uh, Northern California, uh, and did all the effects, his shop did all the effects for arachnophobia, had been on Johnny Carson demonstrating one of the mechanical spiders from the movie, and he had this little organ grinder box that made it operate, and I surmised exactly how it worked, and was telling Jamie exactly how this spider operated with the organ box and offset cams that you could program, and, you know, by adjusting their their, their, their orientation to each other. Jamie, let me tell this entire story before revealing that he designed and built that box. <laughs> I was like, home run! <laughs> so, so, Adam walks in the room. What were your first impressions? Well, he's, he is like the same impressions that I have now and the same impressions that everybody has of him. He's very quick and energetic. He's very bright and, uh, and uh, enthusiastic about things. And, uh, and I immediately picked up on, uh, it's, it, there's a sort of thing that we spot in other people when we you know, meet people of like kind. It's, it's this, this kind of thing where you, you, it's kind of like, I guess, a, a pit bull being around a chihuahua. You know that there's, there, you know that, that that pit bull is not really good to have around the chihuahua. And we have that sense uh, about each other when, you know, builders really 
uh, uh, good makers of things have this this thing where you get into you get close to something you get in, faced with a problem and you just sort of absorb it and and and, and internalize the what, what you have to do to it and make it happen and Adam seemed to be one of those people by what he was saying to me and the what what he was showing me and uh, and so I hired him and he became one of uh, my best employees for quite a while. Now when you're talking about internalizing those sort of problem solving skills, is there a time where that can be a detriment because you're also working on a budget and a time scale for projects? Well, uh, by internalizing, uh, if you don't internalize what you're facing on a project, it's basically uh, uh, all the, the stuff that you're thinking about is a useless pile of data on the table. Uh, once you bring that data inside then you, and you internalize it, you can recreate it in your head uh, or, or, or pull it into your head, then you can start to build it in your head. And, uh, and that's what we do when we build um, and it's, it's not at all an, a hindrance. If anything, it means that, uh, that you're, uh, I like to say that it allows us to actually see the future without building things. It's like running a computer sim simulation or something, but we do that in our heads and uh, and, and, and so doing, we gain control over, we, and we, we understand that's how we create things, is, is having that data accessible, then we can generate new things that, don't ex that never existed before. Yeah, result. but in the film industry also, there's a very specific thing that you look for and you need, which is the ability to work really fast. And it's not enough to be interested in solving problems and being able to solve problems. The elegance and the refinement that you need to achieve in order to be able to get it done by tomorrow. I mean, these were freelance jobs where Jamie, at one point I remember, called me up at lunchtime on a Thursday and said, I need to do these waterfall effects for this photographer. And I said, great, I could come in tomorrow. And he goes, no, 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 we're shooting tomorrow. I need you to come in now. And then we were there until 8 o'clock that night working on these, working on these waterfall effects. And I, particularly like that. Jamie and I have worked with engineers over the years who are really great at building stuff, but it takes them two weeks where it would take us a day. And that, that person is great at building things, but just not for the film industry. So you always have to be primed and on call. What's that? You always have to be primed and on call. To yeah, and you know, liking, liking the challenge. Again, like I said, a deadline refines refines your options down to a limited set and one of the you know film is a very high pressure environment there's a there's a term in Los Angeles when you're an effects technician and you're trying to make something work while the entire crew is watching and it occurs to you that they cost something like three thousand dollars a minute uh, it's called your turn in the barrel and that's the punchline of a terrible joke I'm not gonna tell because <laughs> apparently I might be on DC TV right now <laughs> I mean, is there something that sticks out in your mind as the, the toughest, toughest project that you were handed, the one that, that seemed nearly impossible? You know, uh, I'll tell you, the real ass kicker that we worked on in your shop, Jamie, was the remote control cars from Home Alone 3. Yeah. Those little frackers were... <laughs> This was, this was a job where they wanted a custom car and they were going to take the custom design designed by Nilo Rodas who designed the Slave One for Lucasfilm and they were going to like a toy company was going to take the design and make it into a car so we made these custom cars like 12 of them they all had to be identical they all had to look like store products so the there was a lot of rigor to the process and that immediately made these store bought cars that we were modifying the shells of not work. We've spent 45 days trying to troubleshoot it. That's without a break. We finished the day before Thanksgiving and had Thanksgiving off, not because it was Thanksgiving, but because we finished. Although now I have to say that, uh, you know, we've evolved a great deal, uh, not, on, not only as a result of what we learned over the years in doing effects, but on Mythbusters. And uh, that wouldn't take us any 45 days now. <laughs> you know, that's, Ooh, sorry about that. It's, uh, it's, it's been phenomenal what we have learned. And, you know, you're asking how we met and, and, and eventually it kind of applies to uh, what has happened to us and what we've become. And I think for me, the, the single most important and most valuable thing has been that my mind has just like, it's been transcendental what we've experienced on Mythbusters, what we have learned the, the, the materials, the experiences that we've had with materials and processes have been so mind-blowing for us that it's, 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 a, uh, 
it's sort of a, it's kind of like a foundation thing. You, uh, you, you it becomes a mountain of, of, of resources that you can draw on. And it's, uh, as opposed to somebody that's say a machinist alone, for example, um, that may know, may be a, a, a wonderful machinist and he has all this depth of knowledge about machining, we're going from bacteria to, you know, uh, sculpting, molding, casting, we're, we're going to, uh, we sew things, we weld massive structures, we use explosives, and all of this stuff builds this kind of holistic sense about the way that the world works. And um, problem solving, and you know, being able to parse yeah. and, and, and attack a problem the foundations of which you don't understand when you show up in the morning, but by the end of the day, you have a solution. Yeah, we're able to uh, immediately start working with things that we have no direct experience with and, and you know, work quite effectively with them uh, oh. as a result of that. And it's been, it's been wonderful. And a lot of that has been due to the partnership that Adam and I have had and the, the kind of way that we challenge each other and, uh, and have become who we are. Well, what comes to your mind immediately, if, if I were to ask, which I am going to right now, uh, this is something I absolutely would never have encountered in the day-to-day -day work unless I was doing Mythbusters. Oh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> uh, spraying, uh, working out and then spraying your shirt with pheromones and going to a street and getting dozens and dozens of women to smell your sweaty shirt to see if the pheromones have any effect. <laughs> Um, we, spent a f we spent days and days and days a few months ago trying to herd cats. <laughs> I won't spoil it for you, but it is as difficult as advertised. <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of like don't like cats anymore. <laughs> cats are assholes. <laughs> no, and I think proudly so. I think they'd be like, damn right, I'm an asshole. I'm a cat. <laughs> Well, we never circled back on him. What were your first impressions of Jamie when you first I met I couldn't him? believe he was for real. In, in, in what way? I was like, seriously? The beret? <laughs> okay. <laughs> How else would you interview someone? What's that? How else would you interview someone? Well, no, you know, I, I think that it's really true. You know, one of the things that people ask is, how do you get a start in special effects? And uh, a lot of people, there's a lot of really innovative makers here who've made some beautiful costumes. And I would point out, for instance, like the steampunkers work really hard to make gorgeous things. But if one of them brings a creation to me as an employer, because it's their design, I have no idea how good they were at making it. I don't know how long it took them. But if they come with a stormtrooper costume that they built from scratch, I immediately know what their skill level is. And that's, that's a, not to say that the steampunkers don't have the same skill level, it's just saying that it's harder to understand uh, upon first glance. There's a lot of portfolios you'll look at with all this art in them, and it doesn't tell you anything about the skill level of the person. Uh, it just tells you about some of their aesthetics. But in special effects, 95% of the work is skill. And if you're really good at that, you get to play with the aesthetics. Well, I think it's, you mentioned the, you know, the sort of background and what it takes to get to where you are and get that job. I mean, the one thing I think that's unique about both of you, you have a very eclectic, varied background before you ever got to effects work. The job well, I think that, 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 that actually typifies, that typifies most of the people we work with in effects. They are, they are polymaths all. Oh, I think we have a video that's ready to roll. Let's roll a two-minute teaser of for Mythbusters, shall we? For the record, uh, I was prepared to sing the entire thing. Yeah. It, did, uh, did anybody here see the Breaking Bad special that we did? Yeah. Yeah, how about dissolving a human body in four minutes? Yes. It, you'd have to burn down your house when you were done. <laughs> so I don't know why you wouldn't just put them in the house and burn it down to begin with. Well, the, the interesting, looking back at that first season over ten years ago now, is there anything you look back or think back on something you did in that first season that you would never do today because of safety issues? Because you certainly seem to have become more safety conscious as the years go by. Oh man, particularly there are you, so Adam. Many. Well, I, I there are to, so many. There are so many. Yeah, I have to say first, there, there. Uh, just to preface that, there now, and we, we've been in this position for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have to figure that doing the stuff that we do. Sooner or later, your number is going to be up, yeah. and we figure our, our number is pretty well up. 
But at the same time, we've acquired all of this knowledge about how to make sure that our number is enough. And so where exactly we are, um, I, I don't know. We have, a, it, it kind of goes towards this foundation of knowledge. We have a, an intuitive sense about uh, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't. We have, we have protocols, we have a lot of, and, and I suppose in answer to the, uh, the, the general approach, uh, we have very rigid safety protocols that we follow and, and, it, and it takes care of, I don't know, 99% uh, uh, So of far, the, all of the real difficulties. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, uh, the, the problem with those, with standard protocols is that the stuff that we do is not standard. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> by definition, it's what happens when something went really weirdly wrong. Well, so to give an example, in the very first season, we were doing an episode called Tree Cannon about this tribe that made a cannon out of a tree and fired it. Yeah, and we did, and we fired this beautiful marble cannonball Jamie made out of the wooden tree, and it worked great. But the end of the myth, and this is, we were still finding the legs of the structure of the show. The end of the myth has the, the, the cannon itself blowing up and obliterating the village. So we were like, I guess we should finish by blowing up the cannon, maybe? Like, it was even a question is hilarious. So uh, we, we looked at what it would take, and we realized that a licensed pyrotechnician, these are guys that blow stuff up for the movies with black powder and gasoline, uh, has the permit to use five pounds of black powder. We were like, great, five pounds it is. Oh, and, and wait, I got, I got to tell this next part. So we, uh, we filled the barrel of this cannon with five pounds of black powder, and I get this aluminum cylinder, a, a bar that is a couple inches, three, four inches long maybe, and shove it in the end of there and start pounding with it or, or with a hammer on it. Aluminum doesn't spark. It doesn't spark. It doesn't spark. We and, used a rubber mallet. We were thinking uh, at yeah, that point. But, but, but since then, it's like uh, we, we've, uh, just not to spoil the story, we, we work with bomb techs now and they hate working with black powder. Because oh, it's, it's terrifying it's stuff. Just doing something like screwing the, the lid onto a metal can uh, with, you know, is, is enough to kind of create a little pressure and a little friction and, and the whole pound of black powder blows up in your face. So anyway. Well, so this pyro, we, we, we pack the five pounds in and hammer in this aluminum plug that's really tight at the end of the log. And what we have is a wooden pipe bomb. <laughs> and we say to the tech, so uh, where should we stand? And he said, I don't know, but I'm gonna be 200 feet that way. <laughs> and we're like, okay, great. Let's, for a safety margin, we'll be 300 feet that way. And we set off the thing, and it's a shot that's still sometimes used in the opening of the show. Um, this wooden log weighed about 200 pounds, and it was on a bunch no, of no, railroad it was, ties. It was more like three or 400 Well, no, pounds. I mean, the log itself was even, like... Even that. Yeah. Okay, and then it was on a bunch of railroad ties, so it was 500 pounds of wood that burst into like 30 pieces, none of them weighing less than 20 or 30 pounds, and every one of those pieces flew over all of our heads. <laughs> it's... I mean, like, and the pyro is like this. Wow! <laughs> and he was like, I didn't see that coming. And that's when we learned that the person with the permit isn't necessarily the guy with the knowledge. <laughs> and shortly after that, we discovered the, the, the FBI. But... I will, I will tell you that uh, the myth we shot right after that was explosive decompression at the Mojave Airport, uh, where we pressurized a DC-10 and blew a, a hole in the side and made the whole plane blow up, which was one of the coolest things we've ever done. But if you watch the episode now, you'll notice there's no really good high quality shot of the plane blowing up. And that's because the cameraman was still so pissed off about the tree cannon almost braining him that he refused to stick his camera outside the little metal shelter we were all standing under when we blew up the plane. I mean, were there times in those early days, I mean, one of the things I remember clearly about, particularly in that first season, is generally when Adam would decide to do something, you would have sort of this bemused and concerned look. Oh, no, that's, that still happens. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you, you can recall desperately trying to talk him out of, or you pretty much went, well, if you want to do it, Adam, sure. You know... Uh, I will point out, um, Underwater Car was one we talked over many times because it was a spooky, it was a spooky stunt. Yeah, 
But it's not usually like Jamie's trying to talk me out of stuff. When we're talking safety stuff like that, it's, that's not, the safety margins aren't a push-pull with us. The experimental designs and the methodologies are, but the safety margins are something that, you know, if one person has a concern, it gets addressed. It's not argued over, it just gets addressed. But it certainly, it seemed, I mean, is, can you look back on your stuff? And editing will play tricks on the reality, of course, uh, that you look back and go, I was, I was, you know, pretty reckless in doing that. I was reckless to look at a box that gasoline was about to explode in, but... <laughs> You know, I, look, we've always tried to design these experiments so that anybody could do them because we're not paragons of physical... I'm not a paragon of physical fitness. Um, <laughs> and you, it's safe. If you design something that most people could do, it's going to have a nice wide safety margin. The tighter the safety margin, the more sketchy it really gets. And we're not into tight safety margins. That's not something that we want to do. Right, it's not a daredevil show. No, we're, and we, neither of us are adrenaline junkies. I mean, I remember being taught to jump off a building, and at the end of the day, it's just awful jumping off a building. I mean, it's fun to have done it, but when you're standing there and you want to take that great step forward and fall 20 feet and do the opposite of everything your body wants to do, just the exercise of doing that all day long, I was physically nauseous by the end. But yet you did it. Oh, of course. I mean, do, you, do you find any aspects of the show to be a bit of a, you know, a, a personal journey about, because certainly, I mean, you have a, a you know, a, even a slight a fear of heights, but yet you'll go and do it despite having that. Yeah, it's, it's a weird, it's another weird thing that I've noticed with, like, with a lot of these things that we do that are, you know, there's, we're always about to push some damn button and something horrible is about to happen. Or, you know, we're going off. <laughs> Just like off. the guys on Mission Impossible. Was, it, was yeah. that the original or, pitch for the show? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds about right. But it, uh, you know, we're having to climb heights or do something, and and uh, and the height thing in particular. Some it just it. I just at this point, I just don't like it. Um, I'll do, I can climb anywhere anybody else can and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. It's kind of an exercise in self-control. But the funny thing is that uh, I've gotten so familiar with that feeling of, you know, something really, you know, kind of hard to accept is about to happen. You know, something that's either, you know, it's either going to go horribly wrong or something very crucial, something very expensive, something, you know, something that requires pre precise timing. You know, we've, uh, we did uh, a thing with, for example, um, uh, we did a, a car jump of Dukes of Hazard and having to kind of, this, this car, you know, you have to realize that with a, 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 an RC controller and a joystick that is doing its whole thing over the course of about a half an inch, you know, you're trying to control something that is normally controlled by going, you know. By three or like, four turns of the like, wheel. Like, like this. And, uh, and so the slightest touch is going to throw it off and, and, and you're, you don't have a lot of the feedback that you normally have when you're in the driver's seat. So, you know, there again, and it's happened hundreds and hundreds of times on this show, I'm like, you know, I've got this like super focused in on something threading a needle at, you know, the car's going 70 miles an hour and the whole, you know, days of work and thousands. The sun of, is setting, yeah, the cameras the, are rolling. Thousands of dollars. And, I, and, and at this point, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, I, will point out, <laughs> I will point out that that Dukes of Hazard jump has one of my favorite holy crap Mythbuster moments because we're racing this Chevy towards this ramp we made out of dirt and Jamie's dialing it in. I'm driving the chase car and we've got to stay within 50 feet so that we have the radio range and he's like getting in the zone, getting in the zone, getting in the zone. It's, it's really, it's like the Death Star, right? Do, 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 do. And he hits it and the car takes off. And now it's my job to miss the ramp so I break right, and then I'm driving, and there's a car flying next to me. Yeah, it's like and 30 it's, feet in the air. Yeah, and it's, it's like, I'm, I literally have this, there's a car flying next to me. <laughs> and, okay, maybe I should stop. <laughs> so I pause, and then watch it. I mean, just, you never get to see this stuff, you know? Lightning always happens, and then you're looking. But I get to watch this car land, and go, you know, and then skid like 75 feet. One of the, I mean, so much fun. <laughs> well, I'm crazy. We talk about, you know, the idea of the tiny controller. For your, you guys do that so often. 
What? Actually, now we've gone to more analog controls because yeah, it's so much better. We've yeah, gone to, to steering wheel controls because it's it's a world of difference. There's no reason to go back to. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you can look back on that is a fundamental difference from what the show was originally intended to be that's changed or evolved over the years considerably? I, I'd say there's a bunch of them. I mean. We're different, we're, we're different people than when we started. We're interested in different things. Uh, some of those have diverged between us. Some of them haven't. Um, the narratives we tell go in much more complicated directions. You were like, also alone at the start of the show, just the two of you. What's that? We're just, just the two of you. Oh, yeah, no, season. there's absolutely that. But, I mean, in the very beginning, if you watch those early episodes, the narratives are really simple. And now they're a lot more complex, and that's directly a function of our curiosity and our ability to kind of peel those layers of the onion. Yeah, but we're, you know, we're basically still running around blowing shit up, so... Uh, <laughs> like, I mean... <laughs> it's, uh... Yeah, the, the first video that we did, uh, you know, we... we uh, I, I, they came to me with this possible show to do, and I call up Adam, you know, we thought it was like, yeah, right, like that's ever going to happen, you know, but <laughs> um, uh, we we went ahead and we had an intern with a little handy cam film us, and and, and basically that's what we were doing. We, were, you we know, went setting, into the pyro cabinet, and we pulled out some fireworks and taped them all together, lit yeah, them on fire, we're ran lighting, away. Well, yeah, lighting stuff on fire and running away from it. And the, 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 the teaser that we sent to Discovery is nearly indistinguishable from the show. Yeah. Has that so, teaser ever made it out? It hasn't. I have it. Uh, it's just been something I've been threatening to release for years. Is, and is I that, that going to go up untested? It, it sits on a... Here's the thing. Okay, I will. I promise. Uh, it sits on a little DV tape in my, <laughs> in my cave, and I bought a nice little uh, DV cam deck for digitizing to, to Firewire, and I'm using whatever nine cables are required to get that into a new MacBook. <laughs> Uh, and I, I will get that demo reel out because it's really fun to so see. You're, it. So you're outside dancing around with fireworks. What Empire of the Sun? Is that what it looks like? No, 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 no. It's inside the shop. So it's the same set you're familiar with in MythBusters. And uh, yeah, putting out fires with our shoes and everything. Are you, are you sketching us over there? House left. Excellent. I see her. She's like a court reporter. Oh, is yeah. that what you do? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> is there anything that was in that pitch tape that made it into the first season? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was. Uh, we went up to a dry race board and started drawing out uh, lawn chair Larry, you know, and we thought, you know, so we drew some balloons and we'll give, put a lawn chair on it and, and fill them with helium and we're talking to the camera doing that. And we, oh, this is why I'm just going to tease this is that, and I'll, I'll tease it to you. Um, this was a feature that would show up regularly on Mythbusters, like when we were training goldfish. It turned out that Jamie had already trained a goldfish to ring a bell when it was hungry when he was 18. <laughs> Um, that when we were talking about Lawn Chair Larry, Jamie turned out to have had some experience with flying people from balloons. Yes, I did. Actually, it was my, my nephew, who is, uh, <laughs> is, is now, uh, you know, let's see, he's, he's uh, going to SF State. He's a chemistry major. But, uh, so he made it through it. He, he, he survived. Uh, you know, I, uh, uh, for a Christmas present, we went back to, my wife's from the East Coast, and we went back to, uh, visit them for Christmas, and so we're in uh, in her sister's house with the little boy who was like I think he was three, and uh, he's wearing his Oshkosh, you know, like um, overalls with the straps here. So I figured those were good tie points. And, uh, and uh, uh, what's I, the uh, rating on the uh, Oshkosh suspender shoulders? <laughs> and uh, and so I go to the uh, the welding store, and I had uh, I had thought this through before. I, uh, um, I, I brought some, uh, some uh, weather balloons with me, and, and I forget how. It was like three or four of them. We wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't let me take them outside for some reason. <laughs> uh, he said this in the video, and I can imagine the guys from Discovery going, where did you find these guys? <laughs> yeah. But we, uh, you know, we, we flew them around in the living room for a little while. And, 
<laughs> he, he mainly cried a lot because he wondered why everybody was laughing at him. <laughs> we, we, we heard that there were two, so they showed up three weeks after we sent that demo reel. We, we heard three days later that they loved it in Australia, where Beyond Productions, our production company is. They sent it to Discovery, Discovery loved it, and we heard that Discovery had two comments. One was, holy crap, these guys are perfect, and the second one was, are we really going to make a show about a couple of ambiguously gay dudes from San Francisco? <laughs> Sure. They, they push past their comfort zone, and the rest is history. <laughs> and you two are still together. <laughs> well done, sir. Yeah, I do want to point out, uh, you know, without any uh, making any sexual allusions, it's uh, uh, we have known each other for 20 years, and we have yet to have a meal alone together. Not for lack of trying? True story. Yeah, no, it's just not something where, why, why would we do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, it, if I were to, you know, a thought experiment of, I'm going to give you both a project, same project, but tell you, Adam, to do it in the style of Jamie, and Jamie to do it in the style of Adam. How would you approach <laughs> that project? <laughs> I would use some tongue depressors, rubber bands, and boogers. <laughs> <laughs> and it would probably work perfectly. Uh, You'd use see. colored tape and a lot of flames on the hood. Yeah, I'd, uh, you know, I'd, uh, I'd, whatever it is, I'd, I'd do it like a half a dozen times, but uh, to, before I got it right. But I do, I, <laughs> but, 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 but I do it so fast that I come out done at the same time. You know, when we we did the we did an episode where we had uh, really beautiful silicone masks made of Jamie and I, and we attempted to fool people into thinking we were each the other one. Um, and we hired an acting teacher in San Francisco to teach us how to move and walk like the other. The actor, by the way, is the guy who says in Star Wars, these are not the droids we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. And he teaches me about how Jamie stands, you know, in this way of like, he's always standing as if he's expecting to be knocked over, so he's going to make sure you won't be able to. Um, but the best is the footage of Jamie putting the Adam mask on and immediately starting to do this. <laughs> I'm, I'm overdoing it. The fact is he got really close. <laughs> Obviously practiced it before. Yes. We're going to open up to questions in just a moment. If you can start lining up, uh, the person will stand up and wave in just a moment to where you can start lining up. There we go. Right there, down the middle of this aisle. And <laughs> so uh, we're going to start in just a moment. So I have uh, two questions left, one for Adam, one for Jamie. Uh, first, Adam, uh, I want to ask you about Tested which I've spent many a day pouring through all those videos, still haven't gotten through them. And I've toured the, the, the man cave in, in San Francisco myself, which is an amazing place, which people will find videos on Tested. So what is sort of the ethos behind Tested? Tested is, Tested's our Jamie and Adam, along with uh, Norman Chan and Will Smith. It's our portal on the web. Um, we are trying everything on it. It's, it's a portal of, of, of our interest. It's a, an incubator of, you know, finding out what, what the fans want to see that's not on television, that we're not doing when we do public appearances. And also sort of seeing, seeing different ways of exploring media. Television is not going to exist as we know it. It's going to have some radically different form in a few years, and test it's one of our ways of trying to figure out what form that's going to take. Um, Will and Norm built it and built a beautiful community out of it. It's been nothing but a pleasure to work with them. And the cameraman, Joey Finelli, is fantastic and a wonderful editor. It's, it's a really, really great team. And we've been having a blast producing I, dozens and dozens of hours of content over the last year. It's been a year and a half. Um, and it's been going great. I think, actually, we have a little bit, we have a tested reel, don't we? Are you guys ready to run that? Let's run a little teaser reel of tested. This is the first time we've ever shown this. That's a little taste. Um, the tested community is great. We, we read all the comments we get on iTunes. We read them all on the website. We take them really seriously. We consider it a real community. Uh, and we listen. And that's actually really fun. It's a great way to interact. It's, it's a bump up from just 
being on Twitter, which is what we were before Tested came along. Yeah, I, I also want to add that uh, you know we sort of have a vision with it that uh, it's it may change a lot over the years. The the thing that frustrates us, or at least well, it frustrates us a lot about uh, um, what we do on TV is that. Uh, we have to be so constricted about uh, you know saying things compactly, only having a certain amount. Of, it's it's just the surface of what we do, and whenever we're shooting these these things, these are real experiments, and there's there's just a ton of stuff that is going on uh, that doesn't make it uh, into the the soundbite world that we have to fit it in on the television, and so. You know, being able to kind of uh, uh, blur the lines between uh, uh, what's on TV and and what's on the internet is kind of where we uh, we'd like like to see that as like peeling the layers of an onion. So you can see a, the the outer layer of the onion on the television, but then you can go as deep as you want, uh, and we'll provide that content. Uh, at least that's that's where I'd like to see that go. It's just in the uh, beginning uh, phases of that. So it's a multi-plane experience. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I mean, it, it's an opportunity. It's a. It's the technology is there. I, I, uh, I would like to see a lot more than than uh, us be able to provide a lot more than what we are able to do in a in a you know hour long show with the commercials and everything else. Well, what's what's top on your list of something that hasn't been done on tested yet, but it's the ultimate thing that this is what clearly tested is for. Well, uh, that's a good question. Yeah. I, Thank you. You, <laughs> you know, I, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm doing an, a series right now called The Talking Room. I just put up an interview with John Landis on the site a couple of days ago. And it's, I'm really proud of it. I'm really happy with it. And it's been getting a great response. That's the thing that I'm working on. Uh, and as far as the kind of, I do, you know, obviously build projects in the shop and out in the world, working with Norm on some of the geeky props that we like. Uh, I don't have, we don't have much more than that right now in terms of, of, of a Valhalla to shoot for. And that's, that's nice. It's sort of like a, it's like this room full of tools and we're just sort of figuring out what we want to make. And now before the question, I have one thing. It may be apocryphal, Jamie, but I, I have to ask it. And you can tell me I'm completely wrong in my understanding of this. But somebody told me that every morning you wake up and you ride a bicycle that powers a generator <laughs> that then allows you to watch your soap opera for the day. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I will answer for Jamie. That is just, well, that's just a stupid joke that Adam tells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. I'll, there's a, a thing somebody sent me that... Uh, uh, I think it was if everything that Adam says about Jamie is true, this is what the what Jamie would be like, and it, and, and it was this wonderful thing that starts somewhere in you know the I, mid 19th century, uh, 16th or 17th century, and you know I was responsible for you know uh, figuring out how to cross the hedgerows in World War II by some using a, some farm equipment that would cut it to allow the, the tanks to make it through, and then you know various points in history. Popped up. But odds are, yeah. mathematically, the longer he creates these things, at one point he's going to hit on something that actually is true, right? <laughs> sure. No, actually, though, we'll hit a singularity where it doesn't matter if it's true or not, if everyone believes it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're going to take our first question. Four. Audio. Huh? Test. There we go. Um, this is for Adam. And why do you keep doing the Jamie thing every single episode? <laughs> he's he's just trying to help me out because you know I'm I'm sort of flat normally and uh, you know I'm kind of I'm kind of like you know he's yeah. he's trying to add a little zest to my performance. Exactly. That's my answer. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> you, gonna, you gonna hold it for me? All right. By the way, I, oh, sorry, I just want to make a, a, a statement here. I've been trying to figure out the connection between costumes and kilts. <laughs> but I'm going to just make this statement out there that really, it seems to me that there needs to be a kilt con. Yeah. I'm not sure I want to go, <laughs> but I'm just saying I think it should exist. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Vance. 
My, my job's completely different than yours. I'm a boiler inspector, and I'm trying to keep things from blowing up, okay? Your video of your hot water heater going through the building, God love you, I get down on your knees and pray to you every time I use it for training. What I'd love to entice you guys to do is take a commercial boiler and blow it up on TV. Oh yeah, that's why. Oh yeah. Uh, I can't believe we haven't done that. Uh, yeah. Let me entice you once more. It's never been filmed. Done. Oh, I love you. Done. I mean, just yeah. fully and, done. And by the way, the difference between the, com the costume people and the kilts, only one of them wear underwear. <laughs> I'm, I'm not convinced of that. I, after all these elevator rides, I'm really not convinced of that. Um, hi, Adam and Jamie. I have loved Mythbusters forever and ever and pretty much ever since it came on. It's kind of my go-to show when I've had a bad day. Um, Aw. I'm sorry you've had bad days. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chemical thing. I don't get to get away from that. I'm, I was born broken. That's just the way it is. Um, I get to, um, I'm one of those people whose brain never quite seems to shut off, which seems to be something Adam shares occasionally. And I get, Mythbusters is a show that occupies just enough of my brain that the rest of it will stop. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that so much. I'm constantly watching back episodes. And I happened to run across the episode where you're getting the bees to lift the laptop. And it occurred to me that since you were going to be here, I wanted to find out, did you ever get to try mead? You did bring that up. I did try mead, and it was delicious. It, it was absolutely delicious. Um, I will tell you that um, we get a lot of comments like yours, uh, and uh, I got to interview the amazing Temple Grandin on stage this summer in San Francisco. Um, yeah, she's incredible. And I pointed out in my intro to her that whenever Jamie and I do an autograph signing, um, it looks the crowd for the autograph signing looks like a support group for autism spectrum disorder. And I said, we feel like the patron saints of the spectrum. And if we are the patron saints, Temple is absolutely the Pope. Um, but we, we, really, we really appreciate that the show absolutely does seem to, to, to give people on the spectrum and to give people whose brains are moving very quickly a place to, a place to rest. I, we never expected that. We never think of the children while we're making the show. <laughs> we're just trying to fart around and satisfy our curiosity. So all of these ancillary results are incredibly humbling and we're really glad that they exist. About the kilts, I think you might have just given my husband an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What is, what is your favorite myth that your co-star turned down? Ooh. Oh. That's a good one. That's a real good one. I fight for that one. Yeah. Nice. I don't know. Did, did I, I, I started off that question thinking, I've heard this question before. And I ended it going, I have not heard that before. <laughs> Has that happened? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was never that interested in square wheels. Oh, well, you never said that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it just wasn't my area of fascination. We did that episode because you were totally enthused about it. And, you know, that, it wasn't like I turned it down. And that actually is a difference. It's not like one of us is going to go, no, we will not do this. It's more just like, you know, there are stories that one or the other of us becomes more impassioned about and sort of takes the lead on. Uh, and those are probably about 20% of the stories. The rest were kind of co-running. Co yeah. <laughs> there is one story that, uh, that has been turned down by production, and we haven't, and, and I keep trying to, to pitch it, and nobody uh, supports me in it. And it's this that we, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a video that, and we did, uh, I think Cary Grant and Tori did a, an episode about a guy that is a baseball pitcher. He, he's on a train, he throws a baseball backwards at exactly the same speed that the train is going forward, and to somebody on the side of the track, the ball just falls straight out of the air and, and drops dead because there's no, you've canceled out the velocities. 
And I was a little pissed off because uh, they did that because uh, that was a story that I wanted to do. We really and, wanted to do that story. Yeah, and they, you know, uh, the the production team didn't tell us that, that they were going to do it. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to do was for uh, to to that would for me was just the beginning, and I wanted to have me be the baseball, basically. <laughs> and the idea. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Well, it, it's it's uh, it's a fun idea. It's like if you uh, if you had say this uh, this uh, uh, slingshot, uh, like a reverse fa facing large slingshot on the side of a bus, you know the bus could just be driving along the highway and then and you get into the slot there and then bang, you're on the side of the road. The bus doesn't even even have to stop, right? <laughs> and uh, you know, and nobody will let me do this because they, you know. Is they, your nephew available? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and, and the thing is that, uh, and I keep saying is like, well, you let me do it at five miles an hour if I run off the back of the, the trailer or something that we're doing the test with. And I say, yeah, well, if that works, will you let me do it at 10 miles an hour and then 20, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour? Uh, they, they, somewhere they get lost in that. And I, uh, the fun part about this is that I, I started to parse out what exactly the problem is. And because I got to convince the insurance company and the rest of the team that this is something that's okay to do, and uh, uh, and the problem is not the drop because you can do all this stuff very close to the ground on the trailer, uh, but the problem is that if for some reason the vol velocities aren't matched, like you're going one or you know the bus or the the slingshot is going at a different speed in in the opposite direction, then. Then you, then you start to, you know, then when you hit the ground, you're actually moving in some direction or other. And that could be bad if it's, if it's a lot of movement. Uh, and, and so I, I, uh, I asked myself, what is it about uh, that movement that actually causes the problem? And it's, it's, it's basically friction, because when you interact with the ground and you're moving at a high speed, then the friction causes you to tumble. Things can suck very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I figured all I have to do is remove the friction, and I've not got a problem. And so, uh, with enough KY. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was, you know, it's or, or lard, lard, yeah, lard, or something like that. You know, animal birthing lubricant. We've got uh, all of those. Um, or uh, you know, it, it more practically would be you know a sheet of polyethylene or something like that, and it's it's what motorcycle riders do with the leather the leather suits. If they, the bike falls down, they just slide, and around motorcycle tracks they have hay bales or something like that that they'll they, they'll slide into sometimes. But uh, I thought it was it's an interesting thing. It's a good example of how we develop stories and and how we like I get behind that and nobody else cares. Uh, and so we don't do it, uh, but, you know. Oh, wait, I got it. You should do it untested. <laughs> yeah, sure. there you go. Yeah. Um, I have a question. For the lady who was sketching, how, how did the sketch turn out? Can we see it? Let's make sure we can zoom in. I want to show the audience. Uh, here we go. Take a look at that. That's great. Do you have a sharpie? So this is for the charity auction. Can I can I put a word balloon in? Awesome. Here we go. <laughs> I wrote stop talking for my character. <laughs> Sorry, I guess I'm talking too much. Next question. Hi, um, I was just wondering, has there ever been a myth that you really, really wanted to be true, but it wasn't, like you busted it? I will say, there's a story that fishermen tell about boats whose uh, cables are stretched so close to their breaking point that when they snap, they whip around and slice people in half. And there's not a fisherman in the world who won't tell you that this is absolutely the case. Uh, and we set out to test it, and we built a fairly robust methodology and got a bunch of pig carcasses. <clears throat> no, wait a minute, I'm wondering what the ASL sign is for pig carcass. 
<laughs> okay. Um, and we started denting pigs. We were thinking we'd be slicing them and we were denting them. Don't get me wrong, they would be dead at the end of these cables hitting them. We were trying small and large cables. But I was really, really hoping to see these cables whip through like, uh, like what is that movie, uh, 13 Ghosts or something like that and watch someone get sliced in half. Ghost ship. Ghost ship, that's it. They're both terrible. <laughs> Uh, and at the end of the day, we had to bust it. And I, I, I must say, we are really agnostic. We don't care what the result is going to be as long as we feel it's reasonably supported by our methodology. Um, and that is, that is science right there. In that case, I will say I did want to watch a cable slice through a pig at high speed. Yeah, well, it, it also, our attitude about that points out the fact that uh, there's a lot of stuff that we do that you don't need to know how to do. I mean, you don't need to know how to polish a turd or, uh, you know, what, what happens when poop hits the fan or, you know, how to fly a lead balloon or, or assemble one. But uh, it's all about the process. It's like, it, for us, it's an adventure. If you're, you know, if you climb Mount Everest, is it because the view's so great? No, it's because the adventure of getting there. And so wherever that takes us, when we're designing and building things, that, that's, that's what we want. It, uh, or, or the experience of getting there is what we want. And by the way, I want the, uh, uh, the ASL, uh, this is, uh, oh no, she's looking timid. The, uh, uh, this is funny. Can you show us what, it's, uh, what fart is in? Uh, <laughs> It goes like this. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. The yeah. one high speed shot we've never gotten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Um, I'm really into chemistry, and because of some of the stuff I'm seeing on your show, I decided to go to college to become a chemistry teacher. Wow. And nice. And I was wondering, what are some of the coolest chemical reactions that you think you've ever done? I really like setting off thermite by mixing some blur with some blur. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I would say the, uh, the Breaking Bad thing, uh, the, yeah. the, um, uh, it was sulfuric acid and, uh, and blur <laughs> and, <laughs> in a bathtub. It makes something that is called piranha, and it uh, and and if you haven't seen it, it was uh, it, it's this incredibly was incredibly nasty. Yeah, this was like an explosion. Uh, it was a slow explosion, a slow chemical explosion, because it it was an explosion that lasted for four minutes, and it basically uh, you know made the 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 fuel for the explosive was the you know the fat and the stuff for and the pig. And the acid simply released all the components of the pig and turned them into water vapor and, you know, uh, CO2 or oxygen and stuff like that, hydrogen and oxygen. And it, it was just amazing. You don't, you don't get to see that every day. It was this no. bathtub full of this stuff that would remove the, your, you know, your flesh from your bone if you put your hand in it. Or, and, and, You'd uh, look like that dude from RoboCop. Yeah, it just like you really would. No, and bef just for a minute before you became black sludge. Yeah, you. I mean, you could literally do that with stuff. There's, you put your hand in it and you pull it out, and you wouldn't have any flesh on it. it so amazing. if you're if if you're into chemistry, uh, there's a blog, a chemistry blog that I love to visit and spend lots of time reading called Things I Won't Work With. Yeah. Really, even if you're not into chemistry, this is an incredibly well-written blog. You'll actually learn something about organic chemistry, and there are some terrifying, terrifying stories about noxious, toxic, dangerous oxygenators and smelly things. <laughs> Next question. That was actually the last question. Ah, oh, well. Before we go, as we're, we're going into hopefully the next 10 years of the show, yeah. I thought I would give, <laughs> yes. I wanted to give Jamie a gift to hopefully make the next 10 years of working with Adam a little bit easier. Blinders? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, 
I, I want to say, uh, this is <laughs> nice. Okay, now stop holding it up to because I Jamie's about to take it dirt dirty. I'll bet. <laughs> you know, go. <laughs> uh. Sorry. Uh, this is Jamie's first Dragon Con. You guys are you guys are our favorite kind of crowd to talk in front of. You guys get the jokes. You believe in the science. You understand our mission. Um, this is the reason we come out. This is the reason we do our job. Thank you guys for making Jamie feel so welcome. And thanks for welcoming me a third or fourth time. I can't remember how many times I've been here. We love coming to these things, and we love you guys. Thank you. Thank you.